Hello, I'm just here in the lunch interview. This is the large piece of art uh, by Albina Krominova. I hope I've got the name right. It's a, uh, like a six-sided, to be shown as one piece. The uh, mallet heads represent, as uh, you said earlier in her, uh, her talk, the mallet heads represent the uh, unfeeling nature of the social work. It's just taking these children, suppressing their uh, desire natural desire to be with their parents. About 200 people here today in North London on Holloway Road. Determined that this state of affairs does not continue any longer. And we have this separate piece. Presenting more hope. Symbolising what now needs to happen. The mullet headed men are falling away and the children escaping.
Okay, um, so you just ask me questions. Yes, um, uh, you're uh, Ali, uh, Albina, is it? Yes, yes, Albina Kunirova. <laughs> Yeah, and um, you have this exhibition here at the Children's Dream to be Curd conference. Yes, you... it's only one day exhibition. Yes. For one day, but I, I spent like the whole year preparing since October 2013. Right. And I, I just um, quite feel we need to speak out on this yes. extremely painful subject for and people so much bury their heads and believing that yes. social services do something good. Yeah. In reality, I just say, well, there are probably good social workers, but that doesn't mean that the system is totally yes. flawed. Yes, it's just the easy way out to assume that the experts know what they're doing, isn't it? Yeah, and they yeah, have your best yeah. interests at heart when they don't. We need to get more power into individual lives. Yes. We need to give more power into families. We need to consolidate families, because this is where the devil works. He destroyed, he, well, like Jesus said, um, the thieves come to steal, to kill and destroy, mm. and and he came to give us life and fullness. So I was inspired through Jesus, to be honest, to do this work because I, on my own power, I don't think I would have been able to do so mm. much work in, in one year. Right. Yes. Can you take us through some of the pictures then? Yes. Uh, what's this one? We're we're beside by side at the moment. Yeah. What's this one we're beside at the moment? Did you explain it? Yes. Yeah. He's explain, yeah, explain the, yes. Actually, in my university, it's the best picture. Ah. Because it's uh, so fresh. Yes. Just people, people just not caring, walking on the children is yeah, what it's, yeah. it says to me. This is this is an attitude we've got to got to fix. Mm -hmm. Got to get people waking up to uh, that this really is going on. It's not just a bad dream. It's not just um, mm. somebody having a having. Um, just assuming the worst and, and it not being the case that we do have this situation where hundreds of thousands of children are going missing every year. As Sonia Poulton said in her uh, talk just before lunch break, um, there's a hundred thousand children going missing and most councils can't even account for what children aren't there in their children's homes. Yes. It's just absolutely disgraceful. Yes, I believe so that there is a, like a conspiracy. I believe yes. that they will uh, carry on destroying families because if you see it, they enlarge every day uh, the territory. Where mm. they, for example, today I heard that they take children on the basis of animals being abused. Mm. Or I, I, I heard in March there was a uh, news that they taking children away because of they are bees or some kind of crazy mm. things. Because I know, for example, three mothers whose children were bees, and they're perfectly good mothers in other way. So mm. all they need. Not like spending thousands and thousands of pounds taking children away from them. Yeah. They need to print leaflets or brochures or talk to these mothers, give them classes how to yeah. feed their children properly rather than taking them away. Yeah. This is crazy because you do much more damage. And the child, I don't think he'll grow out of obesity, are quite opposite to giving absolutely complex problems to the children when they ch uh, you remove the whole source of the child's security uh, parents if you remove from the parents where the child feels secure the child yes. feels um, happy the, the child feels identity you remove all that what happens a hole and you cannot feel it it's anything else yeah there seems to be great reticence doesn't there to um, to do anything that involves uh, putting putting resources directly in the hands of parents they'd rather put them in the hands of um, adoption agencies and social workers and, and, and barristers and people like that yes. so the whole process costs the taxpayer enormous amounts of money and it actually produces harm to children at the end of it yeah and it's the most amazing thing this is an economic crisis yes we live like a safe, what is it it's a, it's crazy because yes. we don't have um, resources for saving people from the flood no we don't have resources for uh, helping elderly but we have immense resources billions and billions of pounds spent on taking away children from yeah. their parents and this is absolutely crazy it's beyond me yes oh. yeah it's it's really really bad yeah we borrow Please. money I mean like no tomorrow what for what for to take away children from families this is yeah. and everyone is at risk because the way how they do this fabricated cases or they use minor pretexts where there's no offense or a minor offense and they take away the child where there should be warning given or education given or mm -hmm. something provided or some 
you know, that money could have been spent much more on consolidating family and Oh, yes. Them. But that wouldn't go into the pockets of the people that are conspiring to do it, exactly. would it then? Exactly. That's what is the root of the problem. Yes. And Jesus said uh, that basically, you know, he, you have to choose God or, or money. You know what I mean? And therefore, you're either doing godly things, promoting godly things, or you're promoting money. So this is what it is. It's a problem. The root of the problem in the world is the love of money. Yep. Very foolish because the money doesn't actually exist. Mm. This has no real meaning at all. It's, it's just a, a mechanism so that some certain very powerful people can keep control. Yeah. And I just believe that the heart of a problem with humanity is a problem of the human heart. Yeah. You know, we, we just need to address the human heart because it's, I think people became so callous, so uh, devoted to kind of obeying the system rather than think. They don't think. They just do whatever they want. And yeah. For example, I'm painting here uh, mullet heads like this. They don't think what they're doing. They're no. snatching the children and now the children become an industrial. It's almost like a supermarket. They yeah. Think, and they shop around and they... And actually I heard that you actually can order the child now. Pedophiles can order. And there are mm. cases where from some... Um, you know, social services records, the children disappear. Why don't they yeah. disappear? Why, why is it secrecy? Why don't we address the system? Thousands start? disappear. Yeah, thousands of children yeah. disappear. Why? Where? And then we know about the firings and then we learn like when they're dead about them abusing each other. But yeah. why are we not acting when they're alive? Yeah, there's, so there's an immense, life. there is an immense reluctance to act against these people. Uh, so many times the police get past evidence and, and it's now on a matter of official record that um, things passed to Leon Britton got yeah. lost. Things yeah. passed to the Home Secretary, Leon Britton at the time, got lost. How can important papers about such an important thing just get lost? Well, it's obvious because somebody <laughs> yes. very, very important and helped. Yes. And they, they need to lose these papers because to please that person. So yes. the people who did the losing of these papers, yes. I mean, they're criminals. They're criminals yes. because they act against humanity, act against those children. And they will be accountable to God, to my family. Yes. They will. The, the NSPCC um, claims uh, has, has asked for a law to make it an offence to cover up for people. Surely it is already an offence to be to be aiding and abetting mm. these the, these criminal acts. Yeah. It's it's surely already an offence. It's just a matter of interpretation. We have specific laws against um, hiding fraud. Yeah. If you know about a fraud and you keep quiet, you can go to prison for for a minimum of five years yeah. uh, just for not not saying when you should. Yeah, but um, interestingly enough, we don't punish people who no. know the, um, what's going on, abuse of the children. No, services. we don't. And the social services go unscarred, they're not punished. Yeah. Why it's, you know, if the parents do something slightly wrong, they punish on the parent and yeah. rip uh, the child away. And yet the, there's far more abuse going on in foster care or in social yeah. services care. Why there is not the same rules apply to them? Are they immune? Are they special people? <laughs> what, what's going on? Yes, it's all very, very strange, isn't it? And I would say, my vision is that we need to call upon people repentance. I mean, in the end of the day, social services, judges, psychologists, <laughs> or, they cooperated with the devil, with satanic plan. Therefore, and they probably feel lost and they've done it already. It's, their conscience is dirty, they darken their conscience, but there's still a redemption possible, even for them, even for those criminals. It is possible. All you have to do, repent with your all your heart. That's what I'm calling upon all social services. I'm calling upon all uh, police or anyone who fabricated the cases. And you know what's going on. You know the truth and you've done wrong. Listen yeah. to me. I'm talking as a representative of God. I'm a child of God. This is a picture of me where I'm fighting with the demonic forces. And I'm just like telling you that you should repent. Yeah. In tears. You will repent yeah. in and tears. And say what you know. God. Yeah. So we Tell can... Tell everything what you say to the Father in heaven and ask for forgiveness and you will be saved and then the Lord will guide you how to get out of this mess you created in your life because there is much greater punishment than the punishment by the system. Fear of God is the beginning of all knowledge.
fear God and then you will do all right. You need to come on your knees before the Lord. Even if you've done something not knowing and you've done wrong, please come forward, come clean with God. That's the most important thing to do. And reveal the system and expose the system. And you be the tool in the God's hands, not in the devil's hands, because there's that only two masters in this world, God and devil. If you are going against humanity, you're doing devil's work. That's my view. Well, thank you very much. It's the end of this little broadcast. Um, we are resuming the conference itself at half past two. Please spread the word about this. This is a really, really important conference. There's about 200 people here on the in North London. Um, a really, really important conference. Um, so please spread the word about this. We must start acting. Welcome back to uh, the very important Children's Screen to be Heard conference on the Holloway Road in London. Uh, just about to start the afternoon session. Uh, please let people know this is happening. This is a really, really important conference about the fate of our children faced with a corrupt system in this country which steals tens if not hundreds of thousands of them a year. I know that's a very hard claim to just accept on face value. But if you look back at the uh, what we've seen in this morning's session, uh, just look back at today's events and those of last Friday outside Parliament and last Saturday morning um, outside uh, um, we're outside Downing Street, where uh, Spot UK are having their demonstration. The last session we had before the lunchtime break was um, the expected journalist Sonia Poulton speaking. It's a very important one to catch up on, but uh, at the moment we are uh, just waiting for the, the live session to resume. I obviously won't be commentating once things start, because it's very annoying for people. But, uh, just give a bit of interruption. Please spread this out. This is a very, very important event here. Let people know it's happening. You wouldn't hear that much from the mainstream media, of course. Organised by the veteran campaigner Maggie Tuttle.
When people stop talking, I can introduce a man who is very, very well known. Um, and he's flown all the way from Monaco to be here especially to speak to you all. And you all know who that is, don't you? Yes. Yes. Miss Ian Joseph. Hello, hello, can you hear me at the back? Great. Shout up. Great. He I shouts won't... at me on the phone, so shout through that. If I shout, I'll lose my voice halfway through. Anyway, uh, I'm glad that uh, you all managed to come. It's a really good attendance. And I want to criticise a bit us all campaigners because, in a way, there was a film made some time ago um, called Rebel Without a Cause. And that's we are, I'm afraid. We're rebels against the system but without a cause, without a focus, without saying what needs to be done. And I think that that's what we should think about today. Because it's all very well throwing our hands in the air, having case after case of the most gross injustice, without saying how we can try and stop such a thing happening in the future. What reforms do we need? And that's what I'd like to talk about for a minute. The most important reform and the most obvious one is to stop punishing people who have not committed a crime. Nearly every family that contacts me, and I have two or three, four new ones every day, plus lots of follow-ups, they, they say, we've done nothing wrong. We haven't committed a crime, we've taken our children, risk of emotional abuse or something like that. And it should be quite wrong. We have laws in this country, as in every country, and it's made quite clear, these are the laws, you break the law and you'll get punished. But now there's a new dimension. It's not just you break those laws and you'll get punished. It's also, don't break any law, you'll still get punished. And that's what happens to the families who lose their children. They lose their children when they have... Oh, that's better. <laughs> they lose their children when they've done absolutely nothing wrong. Only that social workers might think that they will do something wrong in the future. Well, you know, this is punishing people who have not committed a crime. I keep repeating that because I think people should take it up a bit as a slogan that that should be stopped. And the family courts should be abolished as such or merged with criminal courts. In a criminal court, it's quite different from a family court. In the criminal courts, you rarely can, hear, can introduce hearsay. That's evidence from witnesses who don't bother to come to court. In family courts, Hearsay from a social worker or psychologist who doesn't come to court is considered more powerful evidence by the judge than that of the parent who is in court. And that is totally wrong. So, Were you convicted by a jury? By, was there a jury? No, you always want to ask for a jury if it was danger of a prison, you know. Yeah, well, I believe, I believe you. I mean, that sort of thing can happen. But if, if at least you have the proof in a criminal court that you are innocent until proved guilty. In the family courts, if the social worker says that you're a danger to your children, that is taken as gospel unless you can prove that you're not. In other words, you're guilty unless you can positively prove you're innocent. And it's pretty difficult to prove a negative, to prove you're not going to harm your children at any point. Yes? Um, can I just stop there, Ian? Yeah. Even when you prove on their own paperwork that you are innocent, they still won't accept it, and my name is still held 
on a police intelligence computer as a prospective abuser, which has barred me from working for the county council. I worked for the county council in three capacities, child minding, registered by them, adult education lecturer, and we proved we were innocent without any doubt whatsoever with medical evidence, and they still hold me as a... Was that in a criminal court or a family court? I've never court? been to court. I've oh. never been cautioned. I've never been interviewed. I've never been charged. And they're holding my name on a, on a police computer, stopping me from That's, working. That is outrageous. I would think you can, you can, sue, the, you can sue them for, for defamation, I would think. Well, I and you would win. That's, 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 that's my opinion. Sue them for defamation. And I think, yeah. uh, you, I, th I th I think you'd win. No, in the, in the family courts, uh, just read it. I have distributed this leaflet, which I've tried to sum up everything on one page that's wrong and should be put right. So I've got as far as, as the fact that people should not be punished if, they've committed a crime, if they have not committed a crime. It seems so obvious that I'll repeat it again. That is what we should try and do. Now, a lady did say earlier that 100,000 children in state care go missing every year. She did put a zero on too much. It is 10,000 uh, uh, who, who disappear, and that is the House of Commons, the uh, parliamentary uh, committee that found, it, that found this figure. And 10,000 is going missing means that there's a heck of a risk when they go into state care if they go missing. All right, a lot of them are found, but that figure is official. And that must be a greater risk than leaving them where they are. Yeah. Now, one of the things that is a complete and utter myth is the baby P. Is baby P. The social workers will tell you, since baby P, we have to be much more vigilant to stop similar cases. That is an absolute lie, because the number of children since baby P that have been taken for physical or sexual abuse has gone down. The numbers taken for emotional abuse have nearly doubled. Why, why is that? Why is that? It's because emotional abuse is much more difficult to prove against. If somebody says you're going to emotionally abuse your children, it's a matter of opinion. Some people will say you're emotionally abusing your children if a young child of two or three is up at midnight. If they come to France, they'll see that every time there's a fiesta or a fete or something, and there's hundreds of kids like that. It's a matter of opinion how you bring up your children, but you go outside the norm and social workers don't like it. Well, unless you've committed a crime, you should not lose your children. I keep on saying that. But I'm... What, else, what else is different about the family courts? One of the, one of the worst things about it is, of course, the secrecy. The fact that even though uh, Mumby, the pre new president, has said he's, he's sort of lifted the veil, you go outside and broadcast your name uh, and protest, and you'll end up in jail. And any judge that thinks you're going to uh, expose what happens will then put, will put a gagging order or injunction on you. Mumby hasn't stopped them doing that. So that, again, you can't gag people when the criminal courts, because uh, unless national security is at stake or something like that, you, can't, you just can't gag people. One of the other things which is so bad is this, that in a family court, uh, a mother who's quite young, maybe a teenager or something, goes in and she wants her mother and father to go in with her and maybe a grandparent to sit with her. Oh no, they say, we can't admit you. We don't admit relatives to our court. They couldn't do that in the criminal court because anyone can go in. But in the family courts, they deliberately deprive the parents accused of help from relatives by refusing to admit them to the court. And that's why I say again, the simple solution is to have family courts under the same rules as criminal courts. Criminal courts aren't perfect, but they're a thousand times better than the family courts. You have to prove that someone is guilty beyond doubt, which you don't do in the, in the, in the family courts. They also do another thing in the family courts. They quote previous offences. Some, somebody of 40 might have, might have uh, done burglary or stolen something or been in a fray 20 years ago when they were teenagers. They bring that up. They couldn't do that in the criminal court. That would be completely prejudicial. Yes, sorry. Yeah. What's the point for you to be talking about that? Nothing is being sorted out because what we need to do is speak about children after we our relationship with the social workers and with the system. 
Well, that's precisely what I'm saying. You, the people here and the people in general have to have a target. They have to have a name. And my suggestion is that if enough people campaign to merge family courts with, with criminal courts, that, that would change everything if they managed to do that. That is the only solution because family courts are so biased. Lord Justice Thorpe, who was number two before he retired in the family court system, said it is very, it is very serious to take a child uh, from his family Excuse because me, it is so say, difficult. Okay. And I report the case and keep to BBC One or what, what you do about that. I, ask, I am still lying about that. I, I didn't hear what you said, but if I could just finish what I said, then I'll ask you. If I report what I am talking, sorry, people, I don't know if I'm talking English, but I'm trying to explain myself, yeah? But if, if you I explain... If I with my kids, and, the, and if I report what's going on, even in the meetings, do I still have the proof to show to BBC one or two What should we do about that? I, I don't understand what you're saying. You're saying if you record something, should you no, show no, it? The, no, ans no, 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 the, answer, the answer is yes, if you're asking me a question. And the answer is... The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Of course, you should be allowed to show things that you've recorded, if that's what you ask. But I wasn't. But I mean, what that's got to do with anything, I'm not sure. I'm saying that people's previous offences, 20 years or more, should not be brought up, as they would not be in the criminal court, but they are in a family court. And then parents are forbidden to contact their own children. That is one of the most disgraceful things, even when they've committed no crime against children. What's that all about? Letterbox contact. Letterbox contact is rubbish. It goes. It's rubbish. Letterbox contact. It just doesn't happen. It just doesn't. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't happen. It's rubbish. Letterbox contact. Parents should always be allowed. Parents. Parents should always be allowed to contact their own children. And even if they've committed a crime, then it should be supervised, but they should never be prevented forever. But the worst thing is gagging, gagging. I mean, the, the one mother was jailed for sending a birthday card to her children. Another father was, was jailed for waving at his children as they passed in the street. This is against all human rights, and I'm suggesting that the judges who do that were acting ultra varis outside their own authority, that they had no authority. But when challenged, they just say, it's a regular order. That was the last judge that was challenged on that point, said it's a regular order, a non-molestation order, and that's it. You've got to accept it. But you haven't. To molest, if you look it up in the Oxford Dictionary, means to intentionally annoy. How can anyone say you're intentionally annoying your children by waving at them if they pass in the street in the car belonging to social workers? How can you say you're annoying your children by sending them a birthday card? That's perverting the English language to give vent to judges' private prejudices, and it should stop. Now, I must get on to the second point. The next, besides stopping punishment without crime, you should stop gagging parents and children. Too often, they are not allowed to say anything. Children in care are treated worse than the worst murderers. Myra Hindley, Dr. Shipman, Peter Sutcliffe, you've heard of murderers like that who killed any number of people. But when they went to prison, they were allowed to make phone calls out once a week. They were allowed to receive visitors. Children who are taken into care are not allowed either. When a child is taken into care aged 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, the first thing that happens is, you've got a mobile phone, we'll take it. You've got a laptop, we'll take it. You will not be allowed to communicate with your parents, with your friends, with anybody you know. We're going to isolate you. And the, the children think, what have we done wrong? And, and even if their parents have done something wrong, it's disgraceful to teach a child like that. The children didn't want to want money for that. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, it's all right, but I mean, she's only saying the same thing as I do. That of course, anyone who does that should be punished. They should be locked up, but uh, they're not. I mean, that is emotionally abusing children. By yeah. as soon as they're taken, sometimes at six, six thirty in the morning, by uniformed police, uh, and, and and dragged off, and they're completely isolated. And what could be more emotion, emotionally harming than that? And when parents arrive, that's another thing. Freedom of speech goes out of the window. Parents have to sign something to say, we're not going to discuss your case. So they mustn't discuss the coming home with the children. So the children are led to believe by social workers that the parents don't want them home. They're quite happy. Sometimes the 
parents have put pressure on to sign something to say that they're quite happy for the children to be there, because if you don't sign that, we won't let you see them at all. These disgraceful infringements on freedom of speech should not happen. No parent should be gagged and no child should be gagged ever. The only excuse for putting a gag on anybody is if national security, because of, it might reveal the name of our spies in other countries or something like that, but, but uh, terrorism. But these things have nothing to do with national security. There's no excuse for gagging parents, no excuse for gagging children. So I say the second thing that we should go for is abolishing any kind of gagging. Yes. People should be free to speak. Right. The third thing is, if you look at my sheet, is abolishing forced adoption. The UK is the only country in Europe where forced adoption is commonplace. It does occur exceptionally in one or two other countries, but in England, the government pressed for more and more and more adoptions. And not only adoptions, adoptions that are closed, because there are two forms of adoption. Open adoption, which happens, it's generally voluntary, and the parents know where the children are going. Closed adoption means you never go where the child's going, the name is changed, and you don't, don't know whether the child is alive or dead, ever, unless the child contacts you. Well, there is Facebook, I've helped one or two, uh, if you look at my site, which is called forcedadoption.com, by the way, you'll see that I've helped one or two people get together and find their adoptive parents. In every single case where children have reached the age of 12, 13, 14, and find their real mothers and fathers, they have left their adoptive parents and gone back to them. And people say, how cruel of you to do that, these poor adoptive parents. And I say, I'm sorry for them, but they knew perfectly well when they took that child that the parents wanted to keep that child. And if you do that, you deserve what you get. Yes. Especially as in the, most of these cases, the adoptive parents have told have told these children who've been with them several years, of course your mother didn't want you, she's a terrible person, she's a criminal, she's a prostitute, she's a drunkard, and the children believe them, but if you can introduce them, I mean, uh, uh, Winona, for example, is on my site, um, uh, Winona Varney, she, her name's in public, so I can say it, she was astonished when she found her mother was a really nice person, and her sister Danielle didn't want to meet her mother at first, and when she did, she's a really nice person, and these adoptive parents, they didn't beat us, they weren't cruel, but we were treated like animals, like the pets, you know, we were pet dogs and cats, there was no love, it was just part of the furniture. And so they left the adoptive parents and went back home. Social workers went a bit mad, but couldn't stop them. And that case has been repeated all over the place. So abolishing forced adoption. But why do they do it, you know? Well, the incentive is financial, generally. Let me give you some figures. On my site, you can see, for example, an advert on the back of a bus, a public bus, a huge advert, and it says, be a social worker, not sorry, be a foster carer, earn £590 a week per child. So if you've got three childs, you're on to ne nearly two grand, nearly £2,000 a week. Well now, if the mother kept that child, she'd get about 20 quid a week, if she's lucky, for the first one, and even less for the next one. You know, it's completely lopsided. Yeah, do you want to say something? Yeah, just on that point, Judge Headley fostered 26 children. That's a very nice residual income on top of a judge's salary, wherever you can get it. Well, it is a very nice salary. I don't condemn fosterers because if the system is there, I, I, I don't blame people for taking advantage of it. I don't even blame Starbucks, for example, for, uh, for avoiding tax because the rules are there to enable them to do that. You know, it's got nothing to do with this, but if, if, if the laws are there, you've got to work around the system to, to, without breaking it, if you can. So these social workers, they earn the money, because if they don't, someone else will. What's wrong is offering such big sums in the first place, because any social worker having three of somebody's children, £590 a week uh, each, uh, is going to be reluctant to give them back to the parents, if they can help it, and lose all that money. So you don't blame them for it. I mean, the National Fostering Agency was founded by two social workers about 12 years ago. This was an agency which fines adoptive parents for the local authority and fines foster parents for the local authority and charges them a huge fee for doing it. 
Well, these two social workers, who stopped being social workers and went into business there, founded this agency for about 10, 12 years, worked it up. They sold out last year to a company called Graphite, a commercial company, called out for 130 million plus, 130 million pounds, two social workers, very nice if you can get it. This is where, this is where the money goes. Children's care homes, if they, if they don't stay in foster care, they misbehave because they want to go back home, they charge up to four, five, six thousand pounds a week per child. And there may be only two or three children there. The money is terrific. So there's a tremendous incentive. The whole system costs about two billion pounds a year. Billion we're talking about with the courts and everything else. Some of the people just make a damn good living out of it. <coughs> the judges, the lawyers, um, the fosterers, the, the official solicitor, the, all these people. But they thrive on the system, and those who those who who live off the system will support it. There's no there's no there's no mysterious conspiracy because judges ridicule parents who say and say, do you think we're all conspiring against you? And I say, there's an easy answer to that. All our MPs, not all of them, 90% of them fiddled their expenses. Yeah. But they didn't. There was no conspiracy. They didn't have to conspire together. It was what we called snouts in the trough. Big snout in the trough. They were all at it individually, and that's the case here. Birds of a feather flock together, and that's why you see the the guardians, the social workers, um, the experts, all coming to the same conclusion, flocking together at the expense of parents and children. Sorry, you wanted to say something. Yeah, many of the social workers get paid double for this because they get the placement fee, and then they're directors on care companies. Oh yes, they, they often very got two two interests. They're the directors of adoption agencies, care companies, and there's a company called Sanctuary, which pays 250 pounds per referral. What they call referral, they just want the name of somebody who's vulnerable, who they can attack, uh, and 250 quid for that. Doesn't matter whether they're old or whether they're young, because they take old people as well, which is what I'm coming on to. Yeah. And you spoke to them and they said they didn't get 250 quid for a referral? It's only for referring new social workers, it's not for taking... Referring them to what? No, it's not. It's, you can speak to them as much as you like, sir, but in fact, if you... In fact, the 250 pounds is paid for a social worker to find uh, a child or an old person. And they specifically say at either end of the scale. They couldn't say that if they were just referring emptily to nothing in particular. You're saying they refer, refer to what? They've got to refer something to get the money, and that's what they do. They couldn't be referring nothing. What could they be referring? Yeah, okay, afterwards if you like, but you don't get to even 250 quid for just the word referring. You have to refer somebody to somebody else. That's what referring means. So the other thing I wanted, it leads on to taking the elderly from families. And this is another terrible thing which which they do. It's called, not the family courts, it's the court of protection, yeah, which is even more vulnerable. secret. It's disabled and vulnerable people, all of them. All of them. It's more secret. It's even more secret than the family court. People are shoved in jail. Uh, and the idea is this. You have someone like this 94-year-old lady who was in the newspapers not long ago. Um, and uh, she was taken, she was being looked after by two of her relatives from St. Lucia. And the social workers didn't like it because they were looking after her previously and then she said she didn't know them. She was 94 years old and uh, so they took her to court, blocked her money, so that suddenly she went to the bank, she couldn't draw out anything. Uh, and they said, we are going to look after you in future. They took her to court. They said, you haven't got capacity. She's 94 and she's up here, she's the same as you or me. Uh, but, uh, you know, she can only walk around on crutches and long distances in a wheelchair, but she's perfectly sane. But nevertheless, they had a psycho come who she'd never seen before and who she wouldn't talk to. And because she wouldn't talk to him, he put her down as lacking capacity. So that gave the opinion, that gave the, uh, um, 
that gave the opportunity to the official solicitor to come in. And he said, I'll act for you now. And strangely enough, I agree with the local authority. You, you should kick, we'll kick these two people who are related to you out because we don't believe they are related. <laughs> she brought someone over from the United States who could prove that they were related. The judge refused to let them testify, so they came for nothing. But, so the, local, the, the official solicitor, a week or two later, or a month or two later, came to, came to this lady and said, I'm very sorry, but I can no longer represent you. She said, thank God for that, because I never wanted you to represent me in the first place. <laughs> and he said, well, the reason I can't represent you is the £60,000 in the bank, which represented your life savings, which we saved from these predators, these two people from Lucia, who were going to rob you, We've spent it all on our fees, isn't that great? So you're broke. You're broke, my dear. And soon we're going to have to sell your house, my dear. And then we'll put you in a nursing home. Can I pick a point up from yes. there? In South End Council, South End Council, they have something called eBay for Grannies. Well, I've never heard of it. But eBay for Grannies is they put you up for tender. Yeah. And when they're going to put you in a home. And the nursing home that offers the uh, ch will charge the lease fees can have you. Is so they might be horrendous and they might have no proper care, but they're the cheapest, that's where you go. I think what this lady's just told me is horrific, if it's true. It's she true. says, wait, an eBay where? South End on In sea. South End on Sea, they have through. an eBay and they put these old people up for auction, as it were, to, to, yeah. to, to, to nursing homes. Yeah. And the nursing home that puts the best price in is the one that gets them. It, of course, that's the, one that, yeah. that's the one that gives them the least food, the least exercise and the least care. Yes. Okay, I've, I've, got, I've, got, five, I've got five minutes. Right. And of course, I must mention two crusading journalists who have helped expose this. I'm not a journalist, but I am a source for journalists, and Christopher Booker of the Sunday Telegraph uh, and Sue Reed of the Daily Mail have done tremendous jobs uh, putting these cases in the private sector so that you can read about them. Christopher Booker especially, uh, we speak three or four times a week, in fact, because nearly all the cases he puts one in nearly every week, not every week, uh, and goes very thoroughly into all the paperwork and all the material and uh, he and I, you know, exchange. So most of the cases, nearly all the cases he puts in are terrible ones <clears throat> which he gets from me. For example, like the Italian woman who was kidnapped at the airport, put in her home, given a forced cesarean, ripped open, the baby taken out and adopted and then she was sent back to Italy without her baby. You know, this sort of thing. You might have read it. Yes. Over to Ireland and they snatched our child for no reason straight from birth out of the hospital and I was very, very upset. You, you of course you, of course you were. But I've, I've, ne <coughs> I've, I've never said I've never said Cornell I've never said Cornell anyone would be safe in Ireland or anywhere. Nowhere is a thousand percent safe. But you're better off there. Uh, but how they came and did that I don't know. Uh, because uh, it was illegal for them to come and seize it unless you had a process in an Irish court. And I don't know if you did. If you, unless the Irish court authorised them to, then they had no right to take I it. I think you might have said at all. No, I'm sure you didn't. No one have done it twice that I know of. Stafford have done it once. They've, they've sent social workers and police, their local police officers over to Ireland, gone in with guard invading parties, gone in through windows, through doors, and in one case they went through with a JCB for a wall. So I, they I, 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 I believe you. And took the baby, bundled the baby on a plate, unaccompanied, and flew them back. I think you'll find that that hasn't happened very recently because the the tide has turned turned a bit there. Generally speaking, you have a court hearing in Ireland, and generally speaking, the courts in Ireland, they will take your child because the English social workers bring them up and rubbish you. It's, Ireland is better than England, but it's certainly not 100% safe. Not, but it's, it's a lot better because if, your if you can get your child to stay in Ireland, if you can be there long enough, 
But from what I heard, Cornell, in your particular case, you stayed in the hotel and you ran out of cash. So they said that you've got no cash to support the child. I'm not saying that's a good reason to take it, but, but, but that is what I heard. But in any case, I must uh, finish up soon, I've, I've, I've been told. Can I, can I make one last point? Yes. I'm going shortly. I understand, and it would be nice if you could all check up on it, that over 80% of the children that are taken into care return to their parents after the age of 16 or 18. Well, unfortunately, not after the age of 16, because there's a, there's a sort like of mantra. The 80s, Social yeah. workers will chuck the children out when they're 16, unless they've got parents who want them back. And then perversely, they'll keep them till they're 18, which they're entitled to do. This is one of the things which I've found time and again they can, that, they, that they do, unfortunately. So I just want to sum up what, on the back of this leaf, on the front is everything that's wrong. And I've, I've summed it up in one page. And there's plenty of them at the desk there and at the back if you want them. But I want you just to say what foot reforms should you, should you campaign for. It's no good getting up and protesting about how you lost your children without saying what we all think should be done to change things. And I'm saying first, abolish forced adoption. It should be the same as most other countries. It should be abolished illegal. Forced adoption means adoption of a child against the will of the parents expressed in court. Secondly, scrap gagging orders where national security is not involved. There's no excuse for gagging anyone if, the, if they're not threatening the country. And it's illegal as well. I do not believe that the judges even have the authority to do it. But they do it and no one challenges it. And, and it keeps on. And if you do try and challenge it, they just say, no, the, the, this, this gagging order is quite legal. But don't show you the statute which, in, which makes it legal. Only. Um, as I said, non-molestation orders means you mustn't molest somebody. Well, it's not molesting a child to send a birthday card or wave at them or ring them up and say hello. Well, so if you want to take a child in any different They can't do. They can't just arrive and take it. Each country has its own rules. And generally speaking now, if you, if, you, if you oppose it in court, if you're in another country, you can generally manage to keep the child in that country. But there's no guarantee that the social workers in that country, if they have their minds poisoned by British social workers, won't take the child. So it's rare, I tell you, that they actually manage to take the child back now. I think it's but it's... <laughs> well, the European Union, of course, North Cyprus does not belong to the European Union, so you're safe enough there, but you have to get residence, and you can only get residence if you prove you've got a good income or a lot of money in the bank. But at least you're safe for six months there on a temporary visa. But I'm saying the third thing we have to do, you've got abolish forced adoption, stop gagging orders, we should forbid punishment without crime. Nobody should be punished if they haven't committed a crime. There is no point at all in having laws and saying, you break these laws and you will be punished. If at the same time you say, and by the way, if you don't break the laws, we'll punish you anyway. It is ridiculous and it's cruel and it's wicked. So that is perhaps the most important thing. To abolish that, would, would you, it wouldn't stop everything, but it would certainly stop 90% of the injustices. And lastly, lastly, the secrecy. What I say about parents is this that they should be allowed to protest openly. They say, protect the secrecy, protect the children. Well, I think parents whose children have been taken should be a bit like rape victims. Uh, a woman who's been raped, that she has the choice of going public, telling her story in the newspaper, or keeping anonymity. <laughs> parents whose children have been taken should have the same choice. That's what I think. There it is. I'm going to wind up now to let another speaker come. Just remind you again, abolish forced adoption. This, you need a target, we need a focus. Stop gagging orders, stop punishment without crime, and let the parents say whether they want to be anonymous or whether they want to go public or not when their children are safe.
just a very quick request. Um, David Jenkins has been at Diamond Street all week camping out for the um, Scott UK process. If anybody wants to go down after they've finished, the more bodies we can get there, the better. Yeah. Thank you. Subsection 3 of the 1989 Children Act says every local authority shall establish a procedure for considering any representations, including any complaint made to them by, and then uh, at C it says, um, any person who's not parent of his, but who has parental responsibility of him. Um, uh, and um, at B, a parent of his. So B and C, the parent, or someone who's not a parent, but who has parental responsibility. Uh, and there are other people who can similarly make a complaint uh, under this section. Uh, and you can consider and see who these persons are. The complaint is about the discharge by the authority of any of their qualifying functions in relation to the child. Um, again, you can look at the question of what amounts to qualifying functions in relation to a child, but it will mean, for example, that a child who is in care or uh, a child where a placement order has been made, or a child in special guardianship. Um, there are certain statutory duties that a local authority has to fulfil that are part of their qualifying 
function in relation to the child. Subsection 4 of that section talks about a procedure to ensure that at least one person who is not a member or officer of the authority takes part in a. the consideration and b. any discussions which are held by the authority about the action, if any, to be taken in relation to the child in the light of the consideration. Here they're using consideration in the sense of complaint. Subsection 7 says where any representation has been considered under the procedure established by local authority, the authority shall a. have regard to the findings of those considering the representation, b. take such steps as are reasonably practicable to notify in writing, one, the person making the representation, two, the child, if the authority considers he has sufficient understanding, and three, any, uh, and three, such other persons, if any, as appear to the authority to be likely to be affected. Um, that section is tied in with the Children Act 1989 Representations Procedure, brackets England, Regulations 2006. And again, I invite you to have a look at that, download it from the internet, uh, and see what it says. Um, regulation 6 says representations may be made in writing or orally. Regulation 8 1 says the local authority shall not consider or further consider representations under these regulations. So you have to bear, in, bear this in mind if you're making a complaint. Um, if the complainant has stated in writing to the local authority that he is taking or intends to take proceedings in any court or tribunal, so if that was your ultimate intention, you would wait before doing that in order to put in your complaint and get a response to it. B, the local authority are taking or proposing to take disciplinary proceedings against any person. C, the local authority have been notified that any person is conducting an investigation in the contemplation of criminal proceedings. Or D, the local authority have been notified that criminal proceedings are pending. Uh, and the local authority decide that consideration or further consideration of the representation under these regulations would prejudice the conduct of any proceedings or investigation. Time limit on making representations. So representations here now means complaint. Uh, regulation 9. A complainant must make his representation about a matter no later than one year after the grounds to make the representations arose. Uh, there are, there's an exception to that, which you can see in subsection 2, but in general, it's the one year time limit. Uh, Article 10. Every local authority must appoint one of their officers as a complaints manager to assist the authority in the coordination of all aspects of their consideration of representations. B. Take all reasonable steps to see that everyone involved in the handling and consideration of representations is familiar with the procedures set out in these regulations. And C. Deal expeditiously on the handling and consideration of representations under these regulations. So, Article 11 deals with local, local authority action on receipt of representations. I'm not going to simply uh, read that out to you. You can have a look at it. Um, Article 14 deals with local resolution and consideration. So that's where you may agree with the local authority that you're not going to enter into a formal procedure to deal with the complaint. Um, local resolution conclusion is at Article 15. 
uh, investigation of representation is at Article 17. Uh, and in essence, it is clear that um, there has to be a prompt response to a complaint within the meaning of the regulations. And normally, the response will have to be within a 10-day time limit. But it goes beyond that because you can request for a review panel in Article 18. And at Article 19, uh, the review panel has certain uh, rules and regulations. Article 20 sets out um, what happens in terms of any recommendations that have been made in relation to the complaint. Um, and so there is a whole plethora of rules that govern the making and the ability to make complaints to a local authority. And I suggest that you consider them carefully. They also involve consideration being given as to whether or not <clears throat> the complainant should have an advocate to represent them. Uh, and indeed, you can ask the local authority to uh, recommend uh, an advocate to you, having made that complaint. So have a look at those regulations. So what, what might happen? Sorry, could you repeat um, the thing again? Section 26 of the Section 26. We start starting point in section 26, subsection 3. Oh, okay. All right. Of the Children Act 1989. Then have a look at the regulations in the Children Act 1989 representations procedure, brackets England regulations 2006. Representations. Representations procedure, brackets England 2006. And again, you can download this from the internet, yes? How can they consider this though? Because I have probably loads of complaints, you get your review panel, and then you can say, well, I'm going to ask you to consider this or that. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Yes, we received the complaint. It took me 18 months to get to level three. Mm -hmm. And then you were supposed to implement some things, and they said at the panel meeting, these will be implemented within a fortnight. That was about 18 months ago, I'm still waiting. Right, so section 84 is the next thing you need to write down. Of the Children Act, 1989. And it says, local authority failure to comply with statutory duty, default power of the Secretary of State. That subsection one, if the Secretary of State is satisfied that any local authority has failed, without reasonable excuse to comply with any of the duties imposed upon them by this Act, you may make an order declaring that that authority be in default with respect to that duty. Um, and <clears throat> an order under subsection 1 may contain such directions for the purpose of ensuring that the duty is complied with within such period as may be specified in the order as appears to the Secretary of State to be necessary. So, so what is section 84? It sounds like judicial review. Because when you look at subsection 4, it says any such direction shall on the application of the Secretary of State be enforceable <coughs> by mandamus. An order for mandamus is uh, uh, essentially a, a, a writ usually issued by the administrative court in judicial review as a command to perform a public or statutory duty. Now, what's contained in section 84 is not an express or implied right to appeal the decision of the local authority, and it's not a suitable alternative to judicial review, but it flags up to the court the express power of mandamus to compel a local authority to carry out its duty. So what you do it is, having made your complaint and flagged it up under section 26.3, and having referred to the regulations, you remind the local authority of the effect of section 84, right? But you're still allowed 
to go to the administrative court and seek judicial review for a failure to comply with statutory obligations or duties. Does that affect your case? Because my case has never been through the court. Let me just give you an example. Right? So, um, you, no, sorry, you don't have to be in proceedings. You don't have to be in proceedings. No, you, 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 what you're doing here is you're, you're informing the local authority of your understanding, possibly with the help of an advocate, or you're asking the local authority to, to provide you with or point you in the direction of an advocate for advocacy services. You're reminding the local authority how they are supposed to deal with your complaint. Right? On a statutory basis. Um, so I'll give you a, a for example. You turn up to, say, supervise contact, uh, and your child might be in care. Yes? Might be placed with a foster carer. And the appearance of the child gives you cause for concern. You think the child might have been um, hurt in some way. Uh, that's inappropriate. Um, and you want to raise a complaint. First thing you don't do is speak to the child about it. Because what you might do inadvertently is put leading or suggested questions to the child, which a police officer, for example, could never do in interviewing a child because any evidence that was obtained as a result of misleading or suggested questions would not be relied upon. So you mustn't ask the child about it. What, hold on. What you could do, however, and you should do, is draw to the attention of the supervisor out of the presence of the child and not in the hearing of the child that you think something untoward has happened. Could they please discreetly observe it and make a record? And what do you do then? <coughs> Having started that trail, you then put your complaint, which might not be officially a complaint at that stage, put an inquiry to the local authority and say, this is what I saw. I didn't ask any questions about it. Um, I conveyed the information to the contact supervisor. I, I want an investigation, please. Now, of course, investigations, the power of investigations, the statutory duty to investigate is section 47 of the Children Act. Now, what would happen if you made that um, communication and you didn't get a response? Then you would say the local authority had properly informed of the matter of concern but did not respond to me. And that lack of response um, is contrary to the statutory obligation of duty of the local authority. And that lack of response is, to use um, judicial review terminology, irrational. And, and, and therefore, you would say to the local authority, look, um, you haven't responded to me. I'm going to make a formal complaint now under section 26.3. And if you don't deal with that complaint properly, um, I'm going to consider uh, taking judicial review to... But isn't that a problem that you're going to say yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's only after they don't consider... Yes, you're right, you wouldn't come therefore within the complaints procedure within section 26.3. But what you're saying is, if you do not deal with my complaint properly, then I will consider you see, so you haven't issued proceedings at that point, but you you put it in mind that you understand the position, and 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 the position's clear because it's 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 in case law. Yeah.
I just want, sorry, I just wanted to ask what happens if it's the other way around, which is more frequent. In other words, you say don't speak to the child, but if the child is the one that complains, in, I was abused in foster care physically, sexually, or something, what, the child is the one who raises it. You have to speak to it. Well, so again, you, you don't speak directly to the child for good reason. Um, it, uh, in that, um, if the child is in care, um, because of something that you're said to have done or not done. What you don't want is anything that the child says to you which you seem to relay to be part of a body of evidence which suggests that you're simply um, trying to uh, 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 put aside your own responsibility for earlier matters. So, Outside, you, you don't respond to the child directly, would be my advice, right? Um, you use some form of distraction technique, but you do then go and speak separately to the contact supervisor and say, well, of course, if they're supervising, they should have heard it. Well, that's what no. I meant, the supervisor can right. be there. Yeah. The well, if they've heard it, then that's, that's fine, and they should make a record of it. But what you would then be saying is, you then seeking confirmation that they'd heard it, and they were going to make a proper record of it. And then your complaint might be that they don't make a proper record of it, if they don't. But I mean, usually contact supervisors are happy to make a proper record, simply because if they don't, they're likely to be liable for failing to do so, if it's discovered that there's some substance subsequently in the complaint. In the case I'm think of, the muser child, she made the complaint that she'd been abused by the foster, foster carer's son, and she was listed away. The parents never saw her again from that day to this. Well, I, I, you can't. No, you can't comment on the I case. I can't but, comment on the individual but, but case. But that is, that's what, you know, if that happens to the next day, uh, what, what can you do? Well, what I'm saying to you today is, is that the courts are going to come down hard and are coming down hard. Uh, on people who resort to forms of self-help, right? Um, and the last thing you want, if you're expecting a court forum to decide fairly upon issues affecting you and, and your children, is for them to have preconceived views about who you are and where you're coming from before you've actually exhausted, in any event, the, pr the procedures that exist um, within the Children Act, but which you might not be aware of. And I, I wonder how many people today here are aware of these provisions and how they can make these complaints. Not me in detail, sir. Yeah. Michael, sorry. I just wanted to ask one question. How comes right, that we cannot sue social services right, for slander, for defamation of character when they use child abuse as an excuse and they always use this to get the child in the family court and take them away from innocent mothers and fathers? Why is that? That no solicitor won't take on that case. Who won't take on the case? No, oh, no solicitor will take on yeah. the case. Yeah. For defamation, we've got to pay money. Why do we have to pay money for our own child? I'm not sure that's the question. Because obviously slander, so this is of character, is basically very serious. And some people have to use it in the family courts. They turn around and say to mothers and fathers, you have abused your child. When there's no evidence, it's basically the, the balance of probability, you know, it's all done by hearsay, she say, and they discriminate people who've got a disability problem. That is wrong, that is definitely that is, that is discrimination, you know. And <coughs> there needs to be a people's investigation inside these family courts because the way I see it here that there's no jury services in the courts. We're not allowed to bring the doctors, we're not allowed to bring the police in the family courts. It's all done behind closed doors. And basically, you know, this is what the people actually need. We need to have a jury system inside the family courts. It can be recorded inside the family courts. And even at every single child in this country today here, right, they should be speaking to their mothers and fathers via Skype. If we, we all connect to this guy, why can't we have contact on the sky with our children? That's all I've got to say.
Michael. Well, I think there's some people who've had oh, their hands up before you. Oh, fine. Right. I'm just going to quickly say, like, um, I've made complaints against Thurrock in 2009 when they, they ignored my concerns in 2008. I had my daughter return to me in 2009 for the same concerns. My daughter started making disclosures about the paternal grandfather. Thurrock tried to conceal it. We've got the actual evidence now concealing. I took it to court on the advice of the police. Now I'm an ex, actually ex cop up myself. Um, they hijacked the case with 45 concerns. Okay. Um, I was ordered to be supervised. While supervised, my daughter continued to disclose. Contact workers have been intimidated and the police have been lied to that the court orders expired. They won't, be, they won't answer. There's an actual police investigation at the moment. Thurrock are refusing to answer the police. They're lying to Dagenham Social Services. They do not answer my complaints or nothing. And they're just saying the judge dealt with issues in 2012 with disclosures in 2013 14, right? saying like they've got a crystal ball mechanism and they've got no concerns of a six year old saying they need protecting from sex or things can, like that. Can I, can I interrupt you yeah, go on. and say that you wouldn't really expect me to respond <laughs> to what is clearly a very complex and detailed factual background. Um, my not having seen any papers in the matter and, and, and it's really, I don't think this is an appropriate forum to deal with these kind of detailed and complex matters because you do want half answers, you do want half suggestions, you want a bit more. I just want to know why they've just said I'm a risk to my daughter. Well, you're asking me, you know, making what, complaints and basically why they're but, ignoring everything. You're asking me why things don't work, why they're broken, mm. aren't you, really? And why they, why they don't remedy it. Well, well and, why, and why there's no remedy. So, you know, I mean, I'm just maybe for the first time telling you about a way in which you can go about things, which rather more puts the onus on the statutory body right, to actually respond in a concrete way to something that you put to them. And, and once you put them on the spot, We've done that, yeah. right? um, if they behave in an irrational way, it makes them susceptible to judicial review. That's a judicial review. It costs a lot to bring a judicial review action. They're not, the families are not going to get legal aid anymore. How do they do it? Yeah, so it's a self-run out of money, so stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, how do they do it? I mean, how, how, how does anyone? I mean, for example, um, uh, near to where I live, there was, uh, there is a, a successful application to develop um, an old aerodrome into a big haulage container site, yes? Um, and the uh, local populace had to band together to raise the money to pay to challenge the decision, the planning decision. So, you know, how do you do it if you're not funded? I mean, we know that the legal aid um, uh, Legal aid expenditure and shortfall last year in relation to the budget was under by, I've seen two figures, one was 111 million, one was 120 million. So there's an underspend at a time when the courts are in a certain amount of difficulty with litigants in person. Um, so, how do you do it? Well, um, it may be that it just has to be organised in a certain way. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not a campaigner in that sense. Um, I, I'm just here where I can to give the best advice, if I can. So, Mark, you'd have to answer that question by asked. Well, I didn't think you'd ask a question. I thought you'd made um, yeah, I'd have to, I'd wait for a, a little bit of a speech. And you've got, a, you've got an applause, friends. Yeah. Well, now, you've got to remember, Michael, you can't answer everything. Yeah. We all want to open the courts. We all yeah, want I, to I, sue the courts. Before you yeah. go, I think this lady behind you there. Yeah. Um, I've got a, I've got two children in care at moment, and yeah. my 12-year-old is constantly saying that he wants his own solicitor. And since he started saying that, the guardian has not gone out once to see him. I mean, we're pretty sure that she's going to say he's not good at competent. Is how do we go about getting him his own representation? Well, 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 again, you know, 
you're asking me about an individual case. With respect, I'd, I'd rather not get involved with individual cases. I mean, there, there, there may be an answer, there may be a, a more general answer to that difficulty. Um, but you're, if you're in, the, let me just put it in a general way, which is that if you're in a court forum, usually the way to address all of those things is to bring it up in court. Have an argument. The judges just ignore evidence. That's the hardest part of it. I, I can't call it. <coughs> yes, Mr. Mellon. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, Mr. Bailey, that. Uh, Can you speak up, please? Sorry? I can't hear you. Could you speak up, please? Shout. Speak up, louder. Oh, okay. I'm... <laughs> I just wanted to say that you represented me in my case. Well, I, well again, I'd rather you speak about Excuse me. Uh, I, I wasn't going to talk about my case. Yes. I just wanted to say you represented me in my case quite ably. But I'd like to ask you a question which I still feel you can't, you're not going to answer. And I can understand you're not answering the questions that are put to you about individual cases, which I think would be wrong of you to answer in any case. But can I ask you this? which is something I always thought about, wondered about you, Mr. Bailey, was where do you put yourself within this court process? Do you have any criticism for it? Do you feel that the family courts are running quite swimmingly and harmoniously and they're working well? Or are you, are you prepared to say, well, actually, I'm kind of on the left of the system and do see problems? Can, can you answer that? I think with any uh, institution, and in particular the court system, there are always stresses and strains, there are always um, difficulties, particularly when um, there are extensive cuts to public funding, um, where there are cuts to legal aid, uh, and where people struggle to be properly represented in the court and where the courts themselves struggle to deal with um, litigants in person uh, and, and persons who come along to try and help them. I wasn't quite meaning that, Mr. Bill. I was thinking, I, I'll use the word because I think I've observed it and many of us have observed it. I will use the word corruption quite openly. Uh, do you see any of that in your experience happening in the courts? Have you ever seen well, corruption? Well, again, you, you used the word earlier. Uh, are you on the left um, in terms of the difficulty of the court? But now you're using the word corruption, right? Do you see so, it? Well, you know, it depends what you mean by left. It depends what you mean by the well, word corruption. I mean, when something's doing. corrupted, if you say a, 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 a tape is corrupted, yes? Well, in your experience, have you ever seen a judge not practice the law or apply the law as, as you knowingly and wisely should. Paula, can I stop? Can I stop? You cannot ask someone in the legal team these sorts of questions. You're intelligent enough to know that. Well, I, I'm just wondering if Michael well, has got any, any criticism. Is a, is a I, 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 think, I think that the court system um, that we have, for all its faults, it's, it's, it's working as it's designed. Uh, it, 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 it's a product of it's a product of thousands of years of practice. Don't, um, don't you think that you get a much better deal in a criminal court than a family court? Because, because Just about to families are judged on probabilities instead of beyond doubt. How do we access the Queen's bench? to take individuals in the system who we believe are uh, operated in malfeasance and uh, uh, misfeasance in public office, how can we prosecute them outside of the civil procedures? You knew this one was coming. No, no, um, what I would say to you is that is How do we access the Queen's bench so we're not in civil procedures and whether we don't have to pay, and we can because it's man to man, yeah. woman to woman in private equity. How do we access that? Because it's been hidden from us and we want it back. Yeah. I'm, 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 <laughs> look, I'm, I'm not here as a spokesperson for the court. 
course, uh, I'm not here uh, to in some, in some way um, justify a thousand years of judicial process. But why don't you answer Ian's question? Sorry, that was just uh, that was just that I said. Don't you think that the family courts give a very bad deal compared with the criminal courts? Don't, don't you think that um, uh, judging branding parents as abusers on probabilities instead of beyond doubt is a, a retrograde step? And it's not thousands of years. That's only been happening for 50 or 60 years. Yeah, yeah. It's criminal. It should be dealt with in a criminal court with a yeah, jury. Bring I mean. back the grand jury, 24. That's well, the only way we're having a go at Mr. Bailey, though, is it? We all know well, that. Well, no, but I mean, I, I think don't think I don't think we're having a go at him, Maggie. I don't think we're having a go at him. Well, I, you know, I've practiced criminal law for 15 years, you know, and I've seen injustice done to people who are not guilty. Um, you know, that's all we get is injustice. We don't get any justice. It's less likely that someone can get condemned for something if it's beyond doubt than merely on probability, 50%, 51%. I mean, that is, to me, the key to why most of these injustices happen. Yes. That's your view. Yeah, I just wondered what your view is. Oh, it's different standard of proof. Yes. I just wondered if you, if you thought that family courts should stay as they are or should go back to... Well, I think um, not so long ago, actually, issues around children and um, certainly in terms of the statutory function of local authorities, um, it was far more difficult to have an adversarial um, hearing with all parties putting their respective points of view. But in fact, the way it was originally dealt with um, was for in-house council members to make decisions about children's welfare. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking way back there. So clearly you don't want to return to that, where there's a more inquisitorial <coughs> system rather than an adversarial system, which is what we currently have, and which is prevalent on the continent, actually. Places like Germany, it's more of an inquisitorial approach. You don't have children taken in a continent for risk of emotional abuse at birth. That would be very no. I mean, that, that, that couldn't happen in a criminal court because no crime's been committed. It happens in that I just wonder if you think that family courts could be improved if they were governed under criminal court rule. Um, it's not for me to decide that. Um, I've been involved in both jurisdictions. Um, I, I think it's, it's a very interesting question. It's an important question. But I think the difficulty at the moment is um, trying to ensure that everyone's properly represented in the courts that we have, and that everyone gets a fair, um, a fair hearing. Well, I think, I think, Mr. Bailey, that, that a lot of people here will have had uh, had the benefit, or otherwise, of a solicitor and barrister who say, go along with social services when it comes to opposing the uh, court order. Um, <coughs> don't uh, don't dispute it. We'll stay neutral. We won't oppose it. We won't agree to it. And you can write outside. You don't even have to come to court. We'll speak for you. And they come out and say, sorry, you lost. I mean. You don't really need a lawyer to put a white flag up and surrender. I'm not saying, I know you don't do that, but mm -hmm. it is quite prevalent. And therefore, maybe it's not such a bad thing that legal aid, that people represent themselves. At least they can speak from the heart. And why do parents have a risk assessment at home, Michael? When obviously we're not a risk to our children. That's a valid question. Again, that's not another question. Um, I took a case for myself in the Royal Court of Justice last year where I wanted to prove my parental responsibility for a foreign office and claimed that I didn't have parental responsibility. I wanted to a foreign office and claimed that my son was not a citizen. My full court in this case was in fact in my favour. Can you use the microphone? Can you hear me now? Not very well. <laughs> I don't think it's working. <laughs> I don't think it is. <laughs> 
I took a case to the High, to the high Court myself last year, um, and that is working. Um, and uh, I won the case against the Foreign Office where they had removed my parental responsibility in order to cover up something that did not be discovered, or maybe they just made a mistake. Also, they had accepted my British, my son's British citizenship when he had been trapped into Russia. Now, I won the case. However, there was two aspects of the case that uh, bothered me a lot, is that the High Court judge, she made two orders. One was for the police commissioner to respond as to the investigation that was done, communication between the British Metropolitan Police and the Russian police. And also, there was an order made up to the Foreign Office to correspond with the uh, other orders to correspond with the courts to find out whether or not there was any uh, investigation done by the Foreign Office in terms of registration of the case. However, Kafka's covered both of these without allowing the police commissioner or the Foreign Office to respond because they, didn't, they couldn't respond because, because there was no communication between the Metropolitan Police and the Russian Police and there was no communication between the Foreign Office in UK and the Russian Foreign Minister. Now, since the court has not received the responses from the Metropolitan Police for the Foreign Office, would the Metropolitan Police and the Foreign Office be in contact with the court or not have responded? That's the question. They've been directed to respond. That's Sorry? They've been directed by a court to respond. And they, they haven't responded. Well, then you turn them out to court. Is, is that, would that be in contempt of court? Well, it will ultimately be in contempt of court. Unless, you see, to establish contempt, you've got to show that some that the non-compliance was willful and deliberate. The intent, yeah? Right. Well, that is the intent, yeah. the willfulness and the deliberate. Right? But what you do is return it to court, and usually the court will um, deal with that by directing um, a senior police officer, for example, and obviously that could be the, the, the chief of Metropolitan Police to come to court and give an explanation as to why they have not complied with the law. What, what, what kind of uh, form would they use? Well, uh, again, I'm not, you know, uh, this, this, it's not like I, I came to give a talk today. No, I, 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 I can't sort of deal with everyone's individual case because sure. we'll be here all night. <laughs> and next week. And next week. <laughs> but, 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 but that is usually what happens with a court order that's not been obeyed. You restore it to court. Um, and you have more punitive orders that may, in terms of getting those responsible who've not complied with the court order, come to court and explain themselves. That doesn't work in case it's in context. It is in context. It's 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 in context.
which he consequently had to get them apologise through Mr. Judge Mumby, said he hadn't. He, he actually spoke about it in the House of Commons. And what my point is, um, there is corruption in this system. That's what the word I'm talking about. Mm. Corruption. So when somebody tells me that the system is jogging along nicely, don't expect me to ever believe it. I never will. That's what I, I meant, will not. That's what I meant. I had a judge, I ignore police evidence of social workers' lives. You know, my, my MP actually spoke and if forced... If we give him a chance to speak, he's going to tell us remedies yeah. as best he okay. can. Okay, that, that's all I wanted to make, that there is corruption. Thank you.
um, if people do not accept that there is a problem, we cannot move to a solution. Exactly. If people do not accept that this is going on, people are being covered up. They are now admitting that Sue Dando was murdered. That's how scared people are. Jill Dando, sorry. That's how scared they are. But what I'm asking is when there is a procedure and people only have 21 days, three months, say 18 months, with the current climate that's talking about historical abuse, how do we, as litigants in person, use that to be able to show that there is no time frame for justice? Justice is in infinite. And when it is talking about children, you cannot turn around and say, I'm going to hold these children in foster care prison because it's prison for children. They are detained, okay? Because my paperwork says that you're 20 hours over, okay? So how do we use, uh, as individuals, what argument can we use to say that this justice is happening? People can't keep brushing it under the carpet. They cannot hide no. it down if they no. do, down if they don't. ITV, if you didn't see it, ITV exposed it. The judge, people who sit above you, the judge has admitted to what is going on. Okay? So if a judge has the balls to come out and say that there's corruption going on, then we need barristers to do so too. And
Can we have some quiet, please? If it's, if it's Ladies and gentlemen, can we have some quiet, please? One person speaking. You want to go talk, go outside. Um, ultimately, if something is so old but, but systematic, you should speak to your MP. You seek your, your MP to get a public inquiry. Yeah, public inquiry. It's what we need. But how do parents write? A lot of people are dyslexic, they're stuck out on our own well, family. Well, again, you have to organise you know, around specific issues to affect you. We have one person speaking, please. Can I, can uh, please I, listen. Can I go to this? No, I don't Can I go to this? I wonder if you had her hand up or something like that. I had a supervisor's contact um, court ordered and social services tried for reducing my court order. I had to pay for a barrister to take it back to court. I won the case and then social services penalised me and said it has to remain supervised forever, like, basically. I've got no exit plan. I haven't seen my daughter for 11 months and she's only her age away alienated from me. Um, but is it right that social services, one of my daughter's notes say that my complaint should not go further at the stage one ever, that's on my daughter's note, is it right that when there's a court order in place that we should then have to be enforcing court orders, causing animosity between parents, because that's all that social services actually achieve, and then they actually lost money because they had to give me a further three months contract, is that right? And you're saying, put me in the place that complaints and we can't. They're not letting us get to the no, I'm, I'm not okay. suggesting anyone put in a complaint, I'm suggesting is how you put in a complaint. Um, but also, if you have a court order, I have uh, now. someone else was mentioning it has a court order, it should be enforced, you should go back to court. I did, but then, my daughter had to wait a month for me to get to court date, and that cost me money to do so. That
But during the last set of seasons, the thing that really is really, really bothering me, and I can't live with it, and I'm just not, it's wrong, is that I'm representing myself, so they're sending their solicitor, it's not sending the papers to my solicitor, they're therefore sending them to me at home because I'm representing myself. They're getting delivered by a courier driver. I'm receiving, like, when the judge says, this position statement needs to be filed on this date by the local authority. I'm receiving all them on time and I'm receiving chronologies, but the whole bundle for my last baby, every paper and every position statement and every, the whole chronology actually, the whole bundle, was not even my family's bundle. I was having other family's bundles. Like, in the same borough, they've got loads of us in court, but what they've been doing is, from when I took over myself and I looked at the paperwork, does anyone else have a sister to do that? And yeah, we try and do it on our own. It is too much to do all of that on your own when you're not qualified. But I was doing, I did four babies, four sets of proceedings within 24 months. So it was hard. But I finally sat down and read it all. And then when the papers are coming through the door, like it's, this, it's August, I'm waiting for the day they're going to send the position statement. I get it, but it's not my family's, it's another family. Oh. And then I'm waiting for the chronology. I asked for the bundles, for the full bundles, to look at it, and everything's recorded on their index, so they know they've put the wrong papers in there for the wrong families, because they wrote the papers as they do on the index. And I received many different families' chronologies going back to 1969. Now, apparently, my family, the judges are obviously, and all the solicitors are going into the courtroom. The judges are not even reading the bundle. They make up their mind from the start. Like, on the first day of the proceedings, a week, less than a week before my baby was born, on the first initial court proceeding, the judge said to me, just save your child to grief, just agree to it today, don't make us go with a proceeding. And I said, no, I can't do that, because I don't agree with that. So by the end of the proceedings, I had, the last time I had a solicitor, the day they banned him from being my solicitor, he basically told me I'm better off without him, because legal aid solicitors are only paid to do a, a reasonable amount, so a reasonable amount won't work for no parent in the family court, he said. You need, you're better off to do it yourself, and I advise you over the phone from the sideline. So he told me that basically I filled in all the applications to note that they're in contempt. I warned them all the way through the proceedings that today I've got this family's papers, they're not mine. Today I've got another family's papers, they're not mine. I know people's information that I shouldn't have, but if, if I showed them papers, my, I can actually, I could have showed them papers to people because I'm not involved in their proceedings, they shouldn't be in my bundle. But I can't do that to other families because their children deserve some respect and privacy. And for them to be locking people up and putting them in prison for speaking or showing, when they're posting other families from my letterbox, is that there's no justice, there's no system, it's just carrying on, it's just happening. They just... What, 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 I, can't, I, can't, I can't understand it. And then no one does nothing. I actually gave all these papers to Claire who was really kind enough to look at them, because I'm not allowed legal aid, and she's passed them on to you, and I know you're very busy, and you've got loads of bundles, you don't probably even have a chance to look at them and know which ones they are. But all these other family papers and position statements that are packed, when my child grows up, I've sent them all from her to you, but when my child grows up and looks at his court bundle, he's not gonna know if I'm, if that family dares me, or if that family yeah, dares me, because I'm not even in there, really. Criminal incompetence. Yeah, I said that, they're incompetent. <laughs> Yeah, and if I ever have another baby, they've already said they need to find an adopted family that can work with the other adopted families. Because it's been decided already, I can't have a risk of emotional harm in the future. Because apparently, I have emotional and several personality disorder. Don't we all? Yeah, we all do. Because it's emotional when your child is being taken a baby. Cannot discuss your own personal cases with you. Mr. Bailey came here kindly to give advice on yeah. the law, mm. you know, to help I us that way. Because as we're all saying, it costs us money if we can't get legal aid. So we should have. It doesn't matter, everybody's got a case, and this is why I get fed up with, with conferences. Sorry, you can't give advice. You can't win. It's as simple as that. You can't win. It doesn't matter if you're you know why we're not winning? Do you know why we're not winning? winning? Because if there's a war, you'll pick up your guns, you'll sing your songs, and you'll march to save what a country that's finished. If you if you uh, you march, everybody march for bedroom tax. 
People march for their social security benefit cuts. Why are they marching for the children? Kelly was going on. Where are you? I paid, I paid over a thousand pounds today, I borrowed from my son, to book a room for over a thousand people. We were lucky we had nearly 200 people. Where's the other, th where's the thousand? I paid for it. Mr. Bailey cannot come here and, and answer all our questions. My grandson didn't care. I'm not asking him questions, because I know it's not correct. Yeah. If we need to know anything about the law, let's ask about the law. But let's get in the streets and march for our children in our thousands. About the law, and that is that is this, quite simply. Do you not think that judges are stretching the English language to sorry? Do you not think that judges are stretching the English language to absurdity when they give a non-molestation order to a mother, and the mother can get jailed for sending a birthday card or for waving at the children as they pass in the street or similar? when in fact the word to molest means to intentionally annoy. So they, they're twisting the English language to use their own purposes. Don't you think that is something that should not happen? Yeah. Are they using non molestation order because it's the cheapest application form in preference to put it on a different Well, that, that's not the question. The question is, is it right? Can we allow Michael to answer? Yes. Yeah. In as much as language is used in different contexts um, in, to have a different sense, then of course you want to take objection to it. Um, but, you know, um, I would be taking objection to that in a court situation, in accordance with a particular matrix of facts. Um, and each case turns, I'm sorry to say, on its own facts. So, um, we know that an assault, a common assault, can be, can be brought about just by a look. That's an assault, as opposed to a battery. Just a look. Um, well, there, there is this. Can I, can I suggest that we don't put any more personal yes. cases to no. Michael? Because I don't think it's fair. No, I've, I've got a he, question about the law. He's a very wise man, and I like him actually, but don't let us put, him, put any more personal cases to him, because I don't think it's fair. He has to look through the whole paperwork before he can make any decisions. So don't let us do that. I think we ought to broaden, I think we ought to broaden the subject out, broaden it out, and let's find out how we can improve the law. I, I don't think that we're going to get much headway if we keep on putting personal cases to it. Well, I think it shows actually that it, it, it's clear to me that you would like to talk about your individual cases. Um, and, you know, whether it's possible for you to do so together amongst yourselves, um, that's a different question. Um, but it's clear to me that you all have your own experiences. We're all here today roughly in the same boat, and the one or two people like me who are just observing yes. the pain and suffering in this community. Yes. It is absolutely chronic. Yes. And I just wonder how much of that filters through to you in your chambers and your inns um, when, you're, when you're discussing perhaps over dinner what goes on in the courts and your experience. Do, do any of you feel that there's something wrong with the job you're doing? That's what we'd like to know, and if so, if there is something wrong, if there is all this pain and suffering being caused, and unjustly in many cases, do you have any sort of club you, you, or discussion you, 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 amongst yourselves Let me be clear right? about what I do. Yes. Right. I represent people in court to put forward their best position possible in relation to a set of circumstances and facts over which I have no individual personal control. But all I am is a mouthpiece for... But you're also a human being. Well, well, well with, respect, well, res with no, respect, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't How think, do you I don't think, 
I don't think I would be asked. Well, I don't think I'd be asked to come to any conference anywhere and be asked what my own personal feelings are. I mean, that's you know, that is so private. That is so private and personal. Um, but I don't think it's a proper thing to ask. Experience their true feelings until some of them start to weep for the pain. It's I don't come down. from a professional class. Sorry? I don't come from a professional class. You don't? No. Alright, well that's already very interesting. But well, well, I'm not here to, I'm not here to pique your interest that? with respect. No. I'm sorry, I'm speaking for everybody here. Okay, <coughs> we, are, we are who we are. We are actually on the receiving end. No. But what you, what you, I, I haven't been doing this for 15 years. That's the length of time I spent doing crime. I've been doing this for 28 years. And, and so what you would have to understand is, is that for me to be emotionally involved in every case that it's I'm involved in would, case, would, would, mean, would mean that I would be, in effect, unable to do my job. I'm sorry. Would you not in your leisure time get together with other barristers and discuss how to perhaps mitigate some of the suffering through the family courts? Could you not at least... Well, what, what we do is, is, is we undertake, it, we undertake can I just to do... Say, I was at Justice Parker's first opening of family court hearing to yes. the public on yes. 25th of May in Watford. Yes. And she said, my colleagues and I are very delighted and thrilled that we have reached this point in the family justice system where at last fresh air is coming into the courts. And I'm very honored and proud and happy to be here presiding over the first open, open court. Yes. Now, is the same feeling amongst you and your colleagues that maybe there are things that are not right in the family justice system and maybe that you, you're laughing? Why are you laughing? Well, because you're try again, you're trying to lead me to a social commentary. Uh, and a specific critique of the court system. Now, what you have to understand is that I'm a member of the bar, I'm not a solicitor. I'm a member of the bar, and I have to be very careful about what I say about the courts, the court system, and the bar. Now, if you, if, if, you know, and, and if, if I'm to continue to practice, I have to be circumspect. I'm not going to give a, a clear view on the left or right or whatever. What I am going to say is that I am committed, unlike some of my other colleagues, to consider cases that I have literally the time to consider unpaid initially, initially, if I have time to consider them on their merits. But I can't change the court system. I can't make things other than they are. I, the court system is not a product of of my thought or my actions, I am within that system. And, and other other legal representatives have to make their own choices. I can't make those choices for them. I'm afraid I can only do my bit. <coughs> I, mean, I think the thing is, Belinda, if I can speak for you, if Mr. Bailey came today, as you know, and said, Well, I'm going to make a speech. Yeah, but he's, only, he's one of, like, he's an odd barrister out there. Who really does work. <laughs> 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 well, you know what I mean. He's a <laughs> 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 yeah, because he wins the cases and we don't want to upset a barrister he's who's here. on our side. He's here. 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 <laughs> yeah, I've got a question for you, and it's about, well, your, it's about your profession. With, with, with respect, there are people... <laughs> yeah, I, have been, I, I can't keep my hand up for... Oh, you've had it up before, I sorry. No, I have been trying to ask questions, but I can't hold it up. I physically can't do it. Right, well, go ahead. But then go, well, go ahead. It's a very quick <laughs> question. It's, it's, you say, you're talking about complaints. Um, if a barrister, if a barrister knowingly was withholds information from the court, and you, and you have absolute proof, it's, it's, it's crucial to the case. The barrister, and there's over two hearings, there's a, plus one barrister instructing another one. So there's five barristers in total who have misled the court. Do you think they should be reported to the Bar Standards Board? 
if they have deliberately misled the court and not provided some very important information. Um, the Barstanders Board have a disciplinary procedure to handle complaints. If you have a complaint to make, then you have to make it to the Barstanders Board. Do you think, um, being in your profession, if I made such a complaint, which is, in my view, very valid, um, do you think I'd then suffer retribution in the future for making such a complaint over such a large number of people? I have no idea. It depends on the nature of the complaint and whether it's up so well, well, look, look, I'm sure you, you, you all have your own views on these things, um, which are, I might add, as equally valid as mine. But if you're asking me whether there is a complaints procedure, Yes, there is. Yeah, I know. I've got forms, yeah. um, and, and it, it, it and, involves and, bringing. You, and if you're asking me, should I be discriminated against in any way for making such a complaint? Um, then you shouldn't be discriminated. Against. But, su but suppose that you are. I'm sure you don't. You're very reputable. But if you if you deliberately withheld information that you knew was crucial, the timing of the, it was a, a permission to appeal based and on a stay because they were going to move my son today. Now that's what they told the court a month ago. That's the plan. That's well, what they I'm told. Sorry, but you're me. asking me to yeah. comment now on an individual. No, case. that's why I'm putting well, it away and, and not asking. You know, you. I don't know anything about the case. No, the and other that's thing what is that there are sub judice rules that haven't been observed. Okay. That's, so that's why I'm not talking is... to you. I'm just really saying yeah. to you that if then at another hearing, which is only an urgent hearing because of the timing, and they still at that point when... I mean, you're, with respect, you're exploring your complaint with me, and you're going no. to complain, I'm not going to... <laughs> but if, um, the question is, uh, should, if I, if I feel that it's a, a barrister or a number of have deliberately misled the court, would you advise people, as you have done with the complaints procedure, do you think then it is right and proper to no, make No, I haven't advised you to take a complaint. I've advised yes, you that there is a complaints no. procedure. No. But you should have said there is a complaints procedure, so if you're making the same analogy that there's the bar standards uh, board and you could make a complaint in that way too. Yes, you can. Yeah. Can I make another <coughs> strictly legal question? And that is this, that Section 8, uh, uh, Article 8 of the Human Rights Act says that we all have the right to a private family life undisturbed by public authority, with one or two exceptions. Um, and clearly the people who drafted that uh, had in mind that they should be protecting the family from the state. That was the purpose of this, fairly obviously. Well now, why is it, do you think, therefore, that in general judges have turned that round to say instead, no, what we really mean is that the child, if you speak to anybody, the child's privacy is in fact being invaded, and therefore to protect that child, we have to protect the state against the family. That was not the intention, surely of those who drafted it. And when I studied law for what's worth even if it was 50 years ago, we were told to interpret statutes to try and give effect to the will of those who drafted them. And in this case, it seems to me that they're using it exactly contrary. What is supposed to be protection for, of the family from the state is turned around to protect the state from the family. Basically, I'm a political researcher and I'm looking at the um, aspects of emotional abuse. Is that better? I'm looking at the aspects of emotional abuse. And the contemporary issues are being faced in Parliament at the moment. It's a bit of a grey area. And they're wondering about whether to make it a criminal offence in the 1933 Act. Um, basically, I wanted to know from your experience of 28 years. Is, is it kind of correct that politics is looking to define emotional abuse? And if so, you know, what, what's your experience? Yeah, I mean, 
that, that question requires uh, a lot of thought um, and, and, a, and a comprehensive response. Um, and you know, it's not really susceptible to um, I think yes or I think no. I mean, um, it's clear that the 1933 Act is now a bit long in the tooth. It really needs to be revisited. Um, it's clear that um, there's a lot of um, research being carried at the moment, out at the moment in relation to what sort of amendments need to be uh, effected um, to that piece of legislation to make it more contemporary. Um, I'm not going to say any more than that. No. That's, a, that's a non-committal answer. Um, it's because you've asked me a very difficult. I mean, most of these questions, the Article Eight question. I mean, you could write a paper on it. Um, quite frankly, you know, and it's not susceptible to a short, snappy, soundbite answer. So I'm not you. On that note, we have to come to an end, I'm afraid, because the um, centre is only booked until five o'clock. Well done, one. Claire, you've managed to just avoid just having really to talk. Very um, short one. I, 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 I just wanted to know, um, a bit of advice, really. Not, not personal, but I know it affects many of us here. When you've done all the complaints procedures and you've even got MPs involved and you're still getting nowhere, what do you do next? Where do you turn when you've tried all other avenues? Go to the National Gallery and you stick a picture of it of your child on the hayway. It's like I say, there are no doors to open unless we come out on the streets and march in our thousands. Come on, people! Guys, these messages. Guys, I'm just please, 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 before we finish, can you please help me out? Can I ask you for help? Can I ask you for help? Can we get Michael yes. Perry a round of applause?
streets or this terrible terrible abomination is going to continue we have family court system completely out of control in this country that much is really clear now right now thank you all for watching and for your full day's coverage please spread these these videos around